So, let's try it. Today we're going to be taking a brief overview of filtering. So by filtering, I'm talking about one-dimensional filtering like you've learned about in EE 341 or 518, if you've taken that. Um, we're going to be talking about such lovely concepts like convolution, the Fourier transform, etc. And the reason we're doing it is because this is one of the simplest things that you can do to a signal once you've captured it, beyond just spitting it back out to the speaker. This concept can be applied to any kind of one-dimensional signal. So not only audio, but also things like your GPS coordinates, although I guess you could argue that's two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Um, it could apply to your accelerometer, to your gyroscope. Good examples for why you might want to filter your data are things like if you're trying to uh, take the signal of your accelerometer and count the number of steps you've taken as you're walking to get like a, I don't know, an exercise measurement app or something like that. You're going to want to clean up your data a little bit, reject the frequencies you don't care about, which are things like the random noise that's inherent in the sensors. Um, some of you may have noticed that even when your phone is sitting perfectly on the table, the accelerometer and gyroscope are jittering around a little bit. That's because these sensors are inherently noisy. There's some black magic that's going on inside them that causes them to have you know, small perturbations in whatever they're sensing. But if you use a good low-pass filter, you'll get a much smoother estimate of the true value. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the absolute basics, things like how to use a filter, what a filter is, why it's useful, etc. And uh, we're not really going to cover filter design very much. If you guys are really interested in how to create filters that have the, the specific characteristics that you want, there's a couple other classes here at the UW that you're able to take, not the least of which is 518. Um, and so for those of you who do know something about filters, what we're going to be covering today are called windowed FIR filters. FIR stands for finite impulse response, and that's what we're going to be dealing with this entire course. We're not even going to touch infinite impulse response. All right, so let's start with just an idea of signals and systems. So some of you have may seen a diagram like this before. It's called a block diagram, and it just shows that I have this thing called X of N coming into H, changing and turning into what we call y of n. So when I have a signal that's indexed by this variable n surrounded by the square brackets, that means I'm talking about discrete time. So rather than something where you'd say like x of t, where you have the parentheses around it, um, this math speak means that it's discrete time, so it's been sampled, and it's only uh, we only have data for specific time instances. So this represents pretty much any of the data that we've been using so far, accelerometer, um, audio, etc. And so a system is something that manipulates these signals. So in our case, it's going to be the filters that we're going to be building. Uh, signal systems can do all sorts of things to, to sorry, signals can do all sorts of things to signals. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to be uh, attenuating or um, whatever the opposite of attenuating is, uh, increasing the magnitude of frequencies within those signals. And the, the nomenclature for this is x of n is passed through h to create y. So filters are systems that operate on frequencies. So for instance, a low pass filter allows low frequencies to pass through, but it, re it reduces high frequencies or rejects them. Um, and of course, a high pass filter is the opposite. So the first thing to realize about a filter is that no filter is perfect. You're never going to have a filter whose uh, whose impulse or whose frequency response, I'm sorry, is exactly what you want. There are always trade-offs to make. And so, like I said, we aren't going to show you how to design filters, but we do need to know a little bit about what they can and can't do. So when we have a filter, we tend to have a diagram like this describing its different attributes. This is an example of a low-pass filter. This uh, axis down here at the bottom is frequency, and the axis up here is the magnitude of the frequency after something has been passed through it. So if we assume that the input was just, uh, the input frequencies were one all across the board, so it has equal representation of every single frequency, and we pass it through the system, we'll get something that looks like this. There's a little bit of what's called pass band ripple. So that's this ripple in the, um, in the response in what's called the pass band, the frequencies that you want to be allowed to pass through the system. There's a transition region where we're transitioning between not allowing frequencies through and allowing frequencies through. And there's a stop band, and we have a thing called stop band ripple. And 
the overall attenuation of these, sig of these frequencies in the stop band is called, of course, the attenuation, or the stop band attenuation. Who here is very familiar with all this? Who here is kind of familiar with this? Who here has no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, great. So a filter is in itself a signal. And that's something that uh, kind of takes a while to get drilled into your head. But the idea is that we create a signal that has these kinds of frequency attributes. And then we will somehow combine it with the signal that we want to filter. So this signal that we... Um, that we're going to combine with our x of n, as it were, we usually call h of n. And this is called the impulse response of the filter. Um, if we want to get a frequency domain plot like this, this frequency domain plot is literally the Fourier transform of this time domain signal. So this signal right here, it looks kind of weird, but that is actually a low-pass filter. And the way you generate these impulse responses, we're not really going to talk about but there will be some code that will be given out to you to generate these kinds of uh, impulse responses. For those of you who are really curious about it, come and talk to me during office hours. The way we apply a filter to a signal is through something called convolution. Now, I hope you guys have all seen this kind of thing before, but if you haven't, we're going to go over it really quickly. So a filter is really just a signal. It, that signal we call the impulse response. And convolution combines two signals, creating a third. And the way that you combine it is through something like this. Those of you who have been working in continuous time all your lives are wondering where the, where the uh, integral sign is. But in discrete time, when you have an integral, it turns into a sum. So we sum from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the length of the impulse response of h. So we're combining n samples of x and h. And we do this kind of flipping and shifting thing where we do a dot product between h and x that's been shifted by n, and we assign it to a single output. And so I'm certain that you guys have seen this convolution thing before, but we have to ask, why are we doing it? Where does it come from? And perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer comes from the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is where we get our idea of frequency from. It takes a time domain signal, converts it into the frequency domain, and we can see things like the magnitude of a certain frequency or the phase of a certain frequency and such. And one of the very basic properties of the Fourier transform is that convolution in, done in time is multiplication done in frequency. And so some of you may have memorized that, but the reason this is so important is because this is what allows us to build filters at all. Because if we want to reduce a certain frequency, what we need to do is we need to convolve it with something whose frequency at that point is zero. Because if that is true, then when we convolve the two, it turns into multiplication in frequency, where k is my, uh, is my index in frequency. And so if h of k is zero, then y of k is going to be zero for that frequency. Everybody get that? Great. So this is our simple intuition with filters. We basically just have to find an impulse response that has a certain frequency response. And if we can find the frequency response that we want, we then just have to convolve our input with that impulse response, and we're home free. Uh, that is the wrong slide. There we go. So let's pull apart the mathematics a little bit. Um, what this is actually showing us is a dot product between n-dimensional vectors. So by dot product, I mean you have two vectors. That's h and x that's been shifted by this n thing. And we do a dot product between the two, meaning we take each element, multiply it by the corresponding element in the other vector, and then sum them all up. And we assign it to our output. So this is showing the convolution result for a single output sample. And so in order to calculate other output values, say for y at the time instant 1, y at the time instant 2, y at the time instant 3, etc., we just change the n in here and do the dot product again. So what this means is you have a signal x that's coming through like this. Actually, I can draw this now that we have markers in here. I'm going to take the lights up a little bit. Does that work? Unfortunately not. We have our signal x that looks like this, and it's a sample. 
we have our impulse response, H, that in our case is just going to be a box car because it's really easy. So let's say it's like uh, one, two, three, four, five samples long. And the way that we do convolution with this kind of thing, the way that we're looking at it right here, we take this impulse response, line it up with our signal, so one, two, three, four, five, let's say that's the five symbols, and we do a, a dot product with those five samples. Dot product gives us a single output sample at time instance of zero. Then we shift this over one and do it again, getting another output sample, shift it over again, doing another output sample. In that way, we're doing this, uh, this math operation here where we're shifting our input over and doing the dot product with that same impulse response over and over and over again. So for those of you who have studied any kind of algorithmic complexity, this convolution idea is not particularly efficient. The reason being, if our impulse response is, say, capital N samples long, then we're doing N multiplies and then N minus 1 additions just for that one dot product. And then we have to do that for every single input sample of X. So that actually adds up pretty quickly once the impulse response gets longer and longer of the filter that we're trying to uh, filter with. And of course, as is the way of things, we usually want a longer impulse response because longer impulse responses are more, um, shall we say, precise. They're, they're able to get uh, better and better filter shapes. So the way we get around this is actually to use that Fourier property that we talked about at the very beginning that convolution in time is multiplication in frequency. And so the way we get around it is we say, well, why don't we just multiply in frequency to begin with? So the way we do this is we take our x of n and our impulse response h of n, we throw them through the DFT, and we get x, k, h, k. Then we can multiply the two, just element by element, to get y, k, and we use the inverse Fourier transform to get y of n. Does anybody have a problem with this? Ah, that's a good question. Actually, it does. It does if your impulse response is long enough. So the Fourier transform, the DFT by itself, would not save you operations. But we use something called the fast Fourier transform. That's what FFTW does. And FFT, the fast Fourier transform is a neat mathematical trick to do the... Um, to do the Fourier transform in, um, I'm trying to think of a way to talk about this without delving into algorithmic complexity lingo. It does it in logarithmic time instead of uh, instead of polynomial time, if that means anything to you. Yeah. Um, so doing it regular is n squared, so you do it n. It's n squared if h of n is, or if, if the impulse response yeah. is long. Okay. So the, the, Algorithmic time is n times m, where n is the length of your impulse response and m is the length of your input signal. And so doing it with the DFT can do it in n log n rather than n times m. There's one difference between this, though. This does something called circular convolution. Who here does not know what circular convolution is? Okay. So this is a little bit different from linear convolution, as you guys already know. Um, and we're usually doing this with... We're usually doing this with window chunks of input and such. So what that means is, if we were usually when you convolve two things, it gets a little bit longer. So circular convolution takes the tail, puts it at the beginning. You guys know this. So basically, just be aware of this when convolving with your signal. We're actually going to be doing a homework where you're going to be asked to do um, convolution. And so if you choose to do f of t based convolution, you're going to need to zero pad your signals so that they don't wrap around like they will with uh, circular convolution. 
Who does not know what I mean by zero pads so it doesn't wrap around? All right. And apparently Microsoft wants to update. Very nice. So, um, since most of you know what that is, we're going to move on instead of doing a circular convolution live demo or something like that. And we're going to talk about asynchronous tasks. If you are confused about the Fourier transform convolution idea, come talk to me after class. So, C Sharp has a few more goodies for us. And these goodies are things that have confused some of you guys this last week when you were looking at how to do the homework. Specifically, the await and async um, operators. These are features that only exist in C Sharp. They're not. We're not going to use them in C plus plus. Or at least, if they do exist in C plus plus, they're a lot more. They're much more difficult to use. And what they allow us to do is create these things called asynchronous tasks without having to bother with dealing with multiple threads. They don't replace the um, the use of threads. They are a specific tool for specific problems. Um, they're more of a concurrency thing than a multiprocessing thing. So the way that we use them is async is used to modify a function declaration like this. We say private async void migrate function. And then within that function, we can apply an await thing to another function. And what this does is it allows this function, migrate function, to stop executing before um, something inside of it takes, uh, like locks up the CPU or something. What we mean by that is, let's say that my other great function goes out and fetches a web page. So my other great function will send out a TCP IP packet to the web server and say, hey, I want to get the contents of this file on your hard drive. And then it will sit there and wait. And it will keep waiting until that server responds with TCP IP packets saying, all right, here's the contents of that file, whether it's a web page or an image or whatever. So when you call this function, it could end up sitting there for hundreds of milliseconds waiting for that packet to come back. And that is a huge amount of time in computer land. So what await and async allow us to do is we can call a function, and that function will stop and wait for the completion of some task, whether it's getting, uh, getting um, a page from a web server, or loading the contents of a file, or opening a connection to a server, all that kind of stuff. Yes? So, so this is, what this is doing is freeing up memory. It's not, it's not running a function, so it's not taking up. Uh, we'll get to exactly what it's used for. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just about to get there. So when that function tries to go out and do that, it stops anything after that function from executing. So if you were to do, if you were had, say, a initialization routine, where you're like, okay, I'm going to open these sensors, I'm going to go get this configuration data from a website, I'm going to load in configuration data from a file on my hard drive, I'm going to create some resources, like some buffers or something that might take a long time, all that kind of stuff. Um, when you get to the point at which you were to ask the OS to like, hey, load up this file that might take a long time, if you have other stuff that can be running at the same time while that function is just sitting there waiting for a response, this will allow us to run that stuff at the same time. And the way it does it is kind of interesting. So first off, you use, you use async on any function with await in it. So I say async, await. Some people say async and await. But when I say await, it gets really confusing when I use the actual word await in English. So I tend to say await. So you, you have to have async on any function that contains an await. And the await keyword tells the compiler, wait for this function. So if this function was to freeze inside of itself, we're not going to go past it. We're going to stay on it. Because what happens is, if we don't use the await keyword right here, what will happen is, when that function goes off and asks for something, the compiler will continue running the other code after this guy 
and then finish up what happens inside that function later on. It's kind of a little bit of magic. What I mean by that is, if we have this function called access the web async, and we tell this client thing, okay, get a string that uh, from this web page, and we store this thing called a task that has this string type inside of it called data, we can call this function, it will, it will send out the TCP IP packet asking msdn.microsoft.com for a string. It will then call this function called do independent work while this function is waiting for the response. Then afterwards we can say, all right, I want to wait for the data to actually come here and the program will freeze right here until we can get the string contents and then we can return. This is only one example of something that you can do with, with awaits and asyncs. But what it allows us to do is, without having to bother with threads or anything like that, what we're doing is we are kind of having this guy go off and do something in another land while we continue to do stuff here, and then we can wait for that, um, for that data to come in when we actually need it. So internally, this makes extensive use of that dispatcher thing that we've been using every now and then. So far, we've only been saying like dispatcher.begin invoke and then giving it some stuff that we want it to run on the UI thread. What this await thing does is it actually takes the, sec the second half of this client.getAstring function and puts it on the dispatcher, waiting for the data thing, waiting for the data to actually come in. So that get string async function actually gets split in half. The first half executes until it sends out the packet, and then it waits. And by waits, I mean it returns immediately after taking the second half of the function and putting it onto the dispatcher. Then we're free to keep on doing whatever work we want, and when we say await, we wait for that work item to put on the dispatcher to actually execute and return us the string that's given by get string async. So you can think of this task thing as like a promise. Client.getStringAsync returns you a task that says, I promise I will eventually give you a string, but I don't actually have it yet. And the way that you make sure that the client makes good on its promise is you say, you will wait for it when you don't have any other work that you need to do. This kind of programming is how we're going to do all of our Bluetooth communication with the, um, with the Arduino board, maybe not next week, but the week after. It's also how we're going to be doing some stuff with the camera, because taking an image can take a little while, and you don't really want your whole UI to freeze up when you press the button to take an image, and you have to wait for it to you know, focus, take a picture, load it into memory, and give it to your program. So the way that we do this is we say, all right, get a picture, and then we keep on doing whatever we want, and when it's done getting a picture, then we can use the await thing to wait for it and keep on doing stuff. So, all async methods return a task. So this method here, you can see it returns async task int. And the int that we're returning is the length of the contents that we just got. So, the magical thing about this function is that when I was talking about a, um, a function half being like executing half and then the dispatcher executes the next half, I was waving my hands a bit and saying, oh, it's a little bit of magic how that function gets divided up into two pieces and the dispatcher executes the second piece. Well, the way it works is the await splits your function. So when our main method calls access the web async, access the web async starts to execute. It executes this line, this line, this line, and then when we get to here, it stops and it waits for the data. When that happens, it looks to the main program as if access the web async immediately returns. And what it returns is a promise to return an int, that task int thing. And so the rest of the program will continue to run until this data is ready. Then the dispatcher comes back here and executes, okay, we assigned the data to straight URL contents, returns the length, and at, when, at the point in which we return this URL contents.length thing, our promise is fulfilled, and anybody who tries to await on our return value is able to actually get our integer value. Everybody get that? All right, great. 
So this is an example. Can you guys read that or is that way too small? I think it's way too small. Does that help at all? A little bit? All right. So this is an example on the MSDN webpage, which I'm sure you guys are all going to go look up once we're done with this because this stuff is confusing, even for me. And this picture does almost nothing to make it less confusing. So we're just going to walk ourselves through it and see uh, the kind of execution flow that happens. So when we call start button click event handler, this is a function in the main page that gets called when someone clicks a button. And so it calls this access the web async thing. It creates this new HTTP client thing. It calls get string async. So what happens is then we call get string async, which comes around like this, comes down to here. And we see that it's this thing called HTTP client dot get string async. It takes in an URL and it gives back a string. Inside of that function, it does some, uh, it does some operation that freezes up the program, probably by calling an await. So then we immediately come back here for, oh, with this blue, um, with this, sorry, with this red line, come back here and we keep on executing this get string, or we get keep on executing only having gotten the promise, not actually having gotten the string. We then can call do independent work. Inside of the independent work, we call, okay, we're working, blah, 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 blah. Let me zoom in, zoom in a little bit more. And then you come back here after doing independent work, and we hit this line that has the A weight. And so when we hit this A weight, the compiler checks to see if the code that client.get a string async, this guy, the compiler checks to see if this guy has finished his work. If he hasn't, then we yield all the way back with this red line to this start button click event handler. So we are now two like layers out from the original a weight because the original a weight is inside that get string async function that we called at the beginning. So now that um, that start button click event handler can finish what it's doing. It can go off to la la land, and eventually, when this a weight condition is done, we come back from here and start executing this function again. We start here, we get the string contents, and then we return the length. And when we return the length, then we come back to the click event handler again. And if there was anybody A waiting on our task integer, then they would be able to finally get that value and continue on where they were where they had left off. Yes. So is this a time based event? Is this I'm trying to understand the, this client that gets string async. Does it take a certain amount of time to get that? Which is why when it hits the awaited, it doesn't have something populated that keeps going. Right. That's exactly right. So this get string async thing is going over, is going out to the internet and trying to get a file, which can take hundreds of milliseconds, sometimes even seconds. Okay. Which I mean, like you know, worlds are born and die in that amount of time in, in your phone. So, um, so it's. That's a really, really long time to wait around doing nothing. So this allows us to do everything else that we possibly can and then just have one little bit of code waiting on that instead of having all of your code waiting on that. Yes? So uh, you got the uh, number six where it's not confused. So number six, I said you wait, but the uh, URL have not returned the string one yet. Why did it go back to the start button? It goes back to the start button because if we didn't go back to the start button click event handler, if we froze right here, that would freeze the entire GUI thread. Because if we just sit there waiting for the string to come back from the from the web server, then we can't do it. Then we're still it still looks to the GUI thread like we're stuck inside of this start button click event handler. So what this does is that after start button click, it'll try to get it, and then the phone will basically run as it usually would. And when the wait is done, then it'll come back. Yes, exactly. So is it kind of like an interrupt? It just goes back regardless of what the process is doing? Um, it will go back. So the way that your phone, the GUI thread internally works, is everything is submitted as work items to the dispatcher. So for those of you who have done a lot of, like, um, who have taken, like, an OS class or something, the way that your processor works is there are multiple processes, and it switches, around, it switches around the amount of time that each process is allowed to use. 
We're doing kind of the same thing here, except that it's not enforced. What happens is you submit a chunk of work to the dispatcher, and you say, run this when you have time. And the dispatcher is your GUI thread just spinning in a loop, trying to execute all of the uh, work items that it has. So when you click a button, that click gets sent to the OS. It detects you know, a, a finger on the touch screen. The OS looks at what the current application is, looks at the XAML elements, finds the, Z the XAML element that is being touched, sees that if it has an on-click event handler. And if it does, it tells the dispatcher, OK, when you have a moment of time, run the event handler for this XAML item. And so the, the dispatcher says, OK, I'm going to start running the event handler. It comes through here. It starts some asynchronous things. It hits an A wait. And it says, OK, this work item is now going to get cut in two. So it cuts the work item in two and says, I'll, I'll do this work part of the work item when this condition is met. Condition met being when the string is actually re returned from the function. And then continues on executing what other kind of, whatever uh, other work items that have been added. Things like when you're scrolling through a scroll list, updating the GUI elements to move around. When you're swiping between a panorama, you know, moving the actual GUI elements around, all that kind of stuff. So if you have something else in your, your UI system that needs that data, you need to put an A weight on it using that data also? Yes, exactly. Yes? So what happens after it's waiting and then you go to something else and click the start, start button again and then you run this whole thing? Yeah, they will. So you have to uh, put some kind of guard in for, against that. Yes? So let's say we, we ran through this and you know, we got to the await and we don't have the string that we asked for for the website. What's the difference between it freezing at that task instead of going back and starting again if it's already run everything else it possibly could? Because eventually, when we go get to this, uh, where is it? When we get to this A wait number six, yes. we come back out to the event handler, and we're actually able to run other event handlers and things like that while we're waiting for that string to be returned to us. Right, right. But what I was saying is, that if those have already been taken care of and done, and that string still hasn't been returned yet, how much difference does it make to start? the event handler over again versus just staying at that task and waiting if everyone else is already done. So let's imagine that you're writing like an RSS reader. All right? You press the refresh button, which then allow, or actually you open the app and it automatically starts refreshing. All right? There are some unread items that you have yet to read through. So while it's refreshing, it creates an async task to go off and get all of the different um, you know, news feeds that you read from. There could be maybe like four or five awesome news feeds that you read from. Fetching all of those could take upwards of five seconds. If we didn't use an async in this, you would not be able to scroll through and like open up your other messages if you haven't read yet and all that kind of stuff. Because without this async stuff, as it tries to go out and get those new news feeds, it's going to be stuck in its for loop going, OK, let's read news feed one. Let's read news feed two. Let's read news feed three, right? And it won't be able to. Um, respond to things like I want to scroll through this list or I want to open this um, this message and stuff like that because when you're doing stuff here you're on the, the UI thread and so if you're doing work nothing else is happening in your program there's nothing else GUI related so this allows your application to have a request out for something and then because you're not actually running any code when you're waiting for the response, you're able to go run other code at the same time and then come back only when the response has been received. May I rephrase my last question? Perhaps I might have said, um, I guess not. I, I perhaps didn't rephrase my question in the right manner. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying why do you need the async and the I, 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 I think I understand that. What I, what I was saying is, you know, had they gone through the iteration already of waiting to get that um, that website string, and it's already run all its other tasks, is it saving any time or memory or anything by going back to the event handler at the beginning to run through even though everything's already done, or just stay at that and wait and wait to like, like what like what does it do at that point 
once it's already finished running everything else, it still doesn't have the website back. Is it, will it just wait at number six, or will it still keep running through even though it's already done everything? Uh, what it does is, so it comes back through number six once. All right? Mm -hmm. And then... Out of the black, we come back out of number seven. Only once. So each of these arrows is only followed once. And so we, we come through, we set everything up, and then we return to the event handler so that we can continue doing other GUI things. We all understand that. But when we go back to do other GUI things, what we mean is we eventually yield back to the dispatcher, who's kind of a master that, does, that goes through all these different work items, and then when there is a certain work item that it can run, it runs it. And it's just not running this number seven work item down here until that condition is fulfilled, meaning until it gets that data from the website. Okay. So that work item is just sitting in the queue, waiting, 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 until that condition is fulfilled. And once it is fulfilled, then it continues to run this work item and finishes, and, that, and then that work item is removed from the queue, and we just don't worry about it anymore. When there are no more work items to run at all, your processor is just idling. Or when there are no work items that you can run, so let's say we've finished everything else and we're still waiting for that string, it's just sitting there idling. Would it be idling at a wait or would it be back to the beginning again? What would that do? Um, it's not idling inside your program. Your program is just these work items that are waiting in a queue and sitting idling in the dispatcher. So all this is under a dispatcher, and, and if it can't do anything else in here, just go back to the dispatcher and figure out what else it can run within the dispatcher. Yes, oh, but so. we're not using the dispatcher explicitly here. Right. We're using it implicitly. Okay. Okay. Yeah? You have a timeout that you want to add in there. Mm -hmm. Can you do that outside of this? You would do that with the client.getstring async. async. That's probably where you would have it. Or you would configure some kind of timeout in the client object itself. So the way that they would probably implement that is they have some kind of task that waits for 100 milliseconds, checks if it's ready, then waits for 100 milliseconds, checks if it's ready, that kind of thing. But that's not something that we're going to cover very much about how to do that kind of thing. That gets a little complicated. But there should be these timeout options that you can set in these libraries. For sure. Alright, so these asynchronous tasks, we won't really be using them this week, but we will be using them pretty much all the other weeks. So that's why I am bringing them up now. And as I said before, these are really useful when dealing with time-intensive operations. For instance, with that line graph interop thing that you all became friends with over the past week. That guy uses async and await inside of himself. Um, and that happens when it's doing things like setting up the direct x uh, surfaces for it to draw to. Um, for those of you who have done graphics programming and such, it actually sets up a vertex shader and pixel shader in order to draw out lines of appropriate colors. And that operation takes like, I don't know, maybe two milliseconds or three milliseconds, which is really, really long. So it creates these kind of tasks to do those operations and wait while those resources are being created and then continue on doing the rest of its kind of initialization. So let's talk about image capture a little bit. We're actually going to start using the camera today. And we're only going to talk about some of the basics because otherwise this homework would be enormous. So at the end of the section, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to take a photo, display it to the user, and save it to the photo library, like that you know, camera roll thing. Next week, we're going to learn all the nitty-gritty stuff. So for this week, you're not going to be able to do things like have a viewfinder, which is where you can you know, move your camera around and see what it's seeing before you take a picture. So it's kind of like, I forget what that photography style is called, but that photography style where you take like the camera and take a picture like this so you can't see what it is you're capturing. I don't know. It was, it was, um, I have a friend who's in love with that. He goes around taking pictures without looking at the viewfinder because it's more challenging that way. Um, we won't be able to do things like bother around with the preview buffer and such, and uh, we won't be able to control things like flash or focus or anything like that. But we will be able to get some glorious pictures. So we are going to make use of this thing called the photo camera class. And it's going to give us a function called, or sorry, an event called capture image available. 
and it has a capture image method that we can call. So, after we call capture image, it's going to give us a stream full of image data. Now, streams are Microsoft's like memory input-output interfaces. So, we, they have things like file streams, memory streams, network streams, all that good stuff. So we can take the stream and pipe it into what's called a bitmap image, which we feed to XAML. And that XAML element that we're going to be using is called image. So this all happens after initialization, of course. And so when we initialize property, properly, we use this thing called a video brush. So this is a lot of different kind of names that we're throwing around, but it really only comes down to a couple lines of code. So, we do this thing where we say things like, we say, okay, we want a new photo camera, and we're going to use the primary camera, which is the back camera, rather than, say, like, some phones have, like, a front-facing camera. And we can subscribe to the events that we want, things like, we can subscribe to the initialized event, and we can subscribe to the capture image available event. Those are the minimum two uh, things that you sub should subscribe to, so that you know when the camera's ready to take a picture, and you know when a picture has actually been taken. You can then create like a bitmap image and video brush and hook the video brush up to the camera to initialize it and then hook the bitmap image up to the image XAML element. So what that means is we create a bitmap image, we create this thing called a video brush, we say, all right, your source video brush is this camera and XAML image, your source is the bitmap. Then... When our, image, when our capture image available event is called, we just update the bitmap source with the image stream that's given us. So let's go ahead and take a look at code and see if we can make any sense of this. So we have la 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 la. Let's go ahead and make this like 150%. We have this photo camera, video brush, bitmap image, and this thing called media library. Don't worry about that for now. Inside of our constructor, we call init camera. And inside init camera, we have this thing called, we say, OK, camera is new photo camera. We subscribe to the capture image available. We subscribe to the initialized. Then we create our bitmap brush, set the source at the source, just like we showed in the, um, in the lecture slides. And the reason we do this is because, oh darn, I closed my, um, my solution explorer. The reason we do this is because we want to look at the XAML. In the XAML, we're going to have this button that when we click it, it will... Um, when you click it, it, I just realized I was in debug mode that entire time. I was actually running the application. That's why it looks so strange. All right. We've got a button and a text block and this thing. This thing is the image uh, element that we were talking about before. So this image element is what allows us to actually display the image after we've taken a photo of it. This image element is this... is this bitmap thing. This bitmap thing that we create here is set as the source for this XAML image. So the image element here is called XAML image. It's a type image. And we hook up a bitmap element to it by setting the source here. This video brush thing is what allows us to, um, is what allows us to save things to the XAML image from the camera. I know there's kind of a lot of moving parts here, but we'll just try and get an idea of how everything fits together. So, when capture image is available, I'm saving it out to the library here, don't worry about that. We take the bitmap and we say, all right, your source is the image stream that's coming in from the camera. And when we do that, it will actually set the image source, so, sorry, it'll actually set the image that's coming from the camera to this XAML element. So let's just go ahead and see what it looks like. If we were to run it in our emulator, 
We have this thing down here that says camera operational. When we click the button, it takes a picture. And what the emulator does for you is it has this little cube that walks around the screen and changes color so that you can make sure that everything's working properly. And that is about it. If you click it too quickly, then it will, t it will cause errors because when we ask for an image, we do that from the shader, shutter button click function. And in shutter button click, we call cam.captureImage. And capture image is actually an asynchronous call. It pauses inside of itself. And it has protections against us calling it again and again and again too quickly. And one of those protections is it throws an exception. So we wrap, so we wrap it in a try-catch block. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with this try-catch stuff by now. So this try-catch block allows, you to, um, allows us to figure out that, hey, an exception was thrown. And so I have this debug text thing here where I just assigned the message from that exception argument that's given me. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with exceptions, let's go ahead and debug this. We are going to mash on that button until it throws an exception. So that means we tried to call capture image and it was not successful. So when we catch it, it gives us this exception. This exception object has multiple members, the most interesting of which is message. It says, cannot be called until capture has completed. So we take that ex.message, oopsies, I do not want to open iTunes. We take that ex.message thing and we assign it to textdebug.text, which is this little guy down here. So when we continue, it should say, cannot be called until capture has completed. And of course, we are using dispatcher.beginInvoke because we don't want to run into problems where we're running on a different thread, say the camera is using a different thread or something and we don't want to touch text debug without being on the GUI thread. Any questions about what you just saw, other than the iTunes library? <laughs> Any questions about asynchronous events or filtering or anything like that? All right. In that case, yes. So you want to do the zero padding? Are you zero padding time, or are you zero padding your your filter? All right. This is good because I actually came up with a demo for this. Um, personally, I detest MATLAB, but I know a lot of us are pretty familiar with it. So I'm just going to use um, the tool that I. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll use the daemon tool to uh, actually <laughs> do something useful. So I have this script in the materials repository, I think. But let's go ahead and load it up. So this guy is, uh, oh, I guess I don't have it in there. Oh, maybe, maybe I put it in the sample code. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Circular convolution. Here we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to define two signals, one called x and one called h. x is the one on top, h is the one on bottom. So x is 1, 0, 0 0.50, and h is 1, 1, 1, 1. All right? And we want to convolve them. Now, those of you who are just convolution whizzes will know that it looks like this. The reason it looks like this, oh darn, let's see, we want this, and then, apparently I don't know my, uh, my swiping, uh, my swiping shortcuts properly. All right, that's too bad. We'll just move them out of the way so that we can get the two pictures again next to each other. All right, so here's X, here's H. When you convolve them, we're going to get a series of four points centered at one and a series of four points centered at three that are scaled down by half. So we have one, one, then 1 1.5, 1 1.5, then 0.5, then 0.5, then zero. Is anybody confused by this 
convolution. Okay. So this is what's called linear convolution. We have two inputs that are both four points long. Our output is four plus four minus one. So that's seven. That's because when we do our flipping and shifting and do our dot products to move aside, there are only going to be seven points for which we have any overlap at all. And we assume that everything outside of these signals is zero. So this thing has zeros all the way to negative infinity, and then zeros from five all the way to positive infinity, and same for h. So that's why we only have seven significant points. If we were to do this with the FFT method, as talked about before, then we would not get seven points out. We would get four points out. And that's the circular convolution part. When you do circular convolution, it looks like this. We get 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. .5. The reason we get this is because this tail end here gets wrapped around and added in on the beginning. That's why it's called circular convolution, because the result wraps around in a circle onto our original signal. So these 0.5s get added to the 1.0s, which become 1.5s all around. The 0 gets added onto 3, and we have only 4 points. Now when we talk about zero padding, what we're talking about is taking this signal, I'm sorry, these signals, and adding enough zeros onto the end such that the wrap around does not get wrapped around. So the tail end does not wrap around properly. Well, and the, why is only the last three the, the tail end? Because these, these elements are the ones that are longer than our original signals. Our original signals are four elements long. Oh, okay, yeah. So this stuff is the extra stuff that gets added on at the end. Gotcha. So if we were to add zeros onto the end, so I'm just going to do that up here. I'm going to make x have 0, 0, 0, and h 0, 0, 0. So if I plot these guys, then, uh, then it doesn't work, is what happens. Let's try that again. There we go. Nope. Oh, I see. I have all these fancy plot limits. All right. So we have 1, 0, 0.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, like that. That's called zero padding. We add on three extra zeros to the end. What happens then is when we perform linear convolution, we change the plot limits here as well. Let's see. That's uh, 7, 7, 14, so that's 13 points. So we have a bunch of extra zeros at the end. So now we can see that if we were to perform circular convolution and have only seven points, all these points that would be zeros, when they wrap around, won't change anything at all. So if we perform the circular convolution, and we expand the limits again, then we see that the output is exactly what we, what we got from the linear convolution without doing zero padding. Everybody get that? All right. So back to image capture. When we're doing this image capture, when we call our capture image available event and such, um, we update our bitmaps source. And this method, just so that you guys don't bang your heads against the wall uh, when you're doing this in your homework and such, it can crash. Can anyone give me a guess as to what possible reasons for this thing to crash would be? And to give us a little bit of uh, a little bit of context, this thing is this guy. So actually, I'm kind of giving you the answer by showing you the the source code. But inside of our capture image available, so this is the event that gets called when we've pressed the button, asked for a new image, and it gives and it calls this event. Why does this guy crash sometimes? Uh, no, time doesn't matter here. 
I guess I'm being a little a little uh, opaque here. Why does let's stop debugging? Why does this crash? Or throw an exception or whatever have you. This stuff, as I said before, doesn't matter because it's just doing the signature library. That E comes from this parameter that's just a little bit off the edge of the screen here. Sorry, what? Bitmap is that element up here that we created here inside of init camera. We say bitmap equals new bitmap image. It's a member of our uh, class. We have this brush thing, we have this bitmap thing, and we have this library thing except that we're not worrying about the library right now. I'm just going to remove all the library stuff. What cost is that event function? That's a good question. So this function is subscribed to an event here. We say cam.captureImageAvailable plus equals camimageavailable. And then all we do is, during shutter button click, we say, all right, cam.captureImage. And then magically, this capture image available guy gets called. How does that happen? OK, so if you use a try here, and if something inside that try failed, P is known. So you can read image stream. You can always raise that. Before we jump to a solution, who calls capture image available? Okay, so you're saying that somewhere inside this guy, we get a call to this guy. <laughs> I love your confidence. Confidence is good. Is it if you click the shutter button twice, you can get the wrong image? That's, that's, a, different, that's a different problem. You guys have run into this problem many times before. All right, so let's, let's, let's have a little bet. If we run this function, and we hit this, uh, this breakpoint, the one on the cam.capture image. How many of you think that we'll hit this function before we hit this second breakpoint immediately after capture image? If we hit this breakpoint first, that means that this callback function is getting called from within cam.capture image. Which one's getting called first? Shutter button click. OK, OK. Let's just do it. <laughs> I love betting my students. All right. So we call, we call this, you gain 10 imaginary points. They're great. So we call this, we press the button. This shutter button click is the event handler for that button that we just pressed. So that's getting called from some magical place where all of our XAML events come from. It then calls cam.captureImage. That's how we notify the camera, hey, I really want you to take a picture right now. All right? Now the question is, which breakpoint will we hit first? The one where it says, hey, I have an image available for you, or the one where we set the text box immediately after making this function call? It can say successful before it's actually successful. Well, I'm making it say successful. I can say whatever it wants. Oh. It's going to say successful, and then it's going to graph it? Why would that be? That's right. So for those of you that didn't hear it, we say continue, and we come right down here. Because if you haven't noticed the theme of the lecture, it's been asynchronous operations. And this camera capture is actually asynchronous. It's going to go off and try and get the image, and then from the somewhere off in La La Land, it will. Where does it say that? Where's the async anywhere? That's exactly right. This capture image has an async on it, but we don't. It has an async somewhere inside of it, but we don't know about it. Oh, okay. That's capture image available. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the beauty of C sharp and the async uh, design is that if you don't want to deal, if you don't have any knowledge about async stuff, 
It can still be doing async stuff behind the scenes. The only time you have to do extra work is when you yourself have to take advantage of the async okay, stuff. So inside that capture image, there might be something like dispatcher invoke stuff like that. Yep. I believe inside there's actually some A weights and asyncs. And so since we are doing nothing with it, half of capture image is executing, and then it's immediately returning, and we get to continue on and do whatever we want, such as set the debug text to capture successful. And then, eventually, the dispatcher will pick up on it again and will run capture image available. And that's how capture image available gets called from that work item picking up where it left off after some asynchronous task has finished. This does not answer the question, though. Once we do get into capture image available and we let it run, we fall into this application unhandled exception thing, which I'm sure many of you have come across before. This happens when there's an exception and we haven't handled it properly. And so we look at this E thing, we say, okay, it's got an exception object, and it says invalid cross-thread access. So the question is, why does this function call throw an exception? And before you ask, if I wrap it in a try-catch, you're like, okay, we know about try-catches now. We can use this for everything. And we can say, okay, text debug dot text equals there was an exception. All right? So this is going to catch every exception that bitmap.setSource can possibly throw. Let's see what happens if we do this. I press the button, and it still throws an exception. Okay, that's actually a little... I, yeah, I think I have to say catch exception E, like that. I think I have to give it a type argument. Nope, still doesn't like it. All right, so something bad is happening here, and I can't catch it. It's probably because there's the exception type that's getting thrown is doesn't correspond to this exception type, but in any case... It's going to happen every single time I run it. There's something else we need to do. Yes? You're not on the UI thread. Aha, you're right. I am not on the UI thread. And there's no way I would have known that unless I read the docs or tried it out and it didn't work. You're right. There's nothing about the code here that says that capture image available gets run off of the UI thread. But it does. So this kind of problem happens when we naively try to touch XAML elements, like this bitmap thing, without being on the UI thread. So that's why I deleted the dispatcher.begin invoke guy. And if I can type, this will go so much easier. So when we put this inside of here, now we can touch the bitmap object without being on the UI thread. And so I guess I just have to thank my lucky stars that none of you realized that I was deleting this part to make the error occur. Because now when we do it, it works just fine. Because we can't touch XAML elements without being on the UI thread. Any questions? All right, so let's talk about this homework. I have gotten a lot of questions about homeworks because students don't really know where to start. So we're going to walk through a little bit of the homework for uh, template and try and all collectively get a little bit of an idea about where to start for this homework. Because this homework has three different phase things. First off, your homework for C Sharp template is as empty as I can make it. So that should help reduce some of the confusion because you start everywhere. No. Um, <laughs> because uh, you're going to add a panorama control and add three different pages and things like that. So what this is going to look like, I'll actually, we'll do like a, a little um, Silicon Valley uh, meeting where I get to sketch out the user interface and you guys get to tell me all 
how badly I can draw it, but it doesn't matter because I'm a UI interface designer. So you're going to have a panorama with three panes. One of the panes will be the camera pane. And you'll do, have exactly like you saw today. You have a little button. If you want to have a text uh, box to spit out errors and stuff, you can. When you press the button, it's going to take a picture. And if you're running on the emulator, you'll get the little Pac-Man cube. I don't know why I said Pac-Man cube, but whatever. The second one is going to be a filter design page. You are going to make a page where we can design some kind of filter. For simplicity's sake, we'll say low pass filter because that's the code that I give you guys. But if you're a real like gung-ho DSP guy and you want to make like a band pass filter or a high pass filter or something, that's not too hard. It'll take you, if you know what you're doing, it'll take you about two minutes to, to modify the code to do that instead. But if you don't know what you're doing and you don't want to bother with it, then you can just stick with low pass filters. And those are the easiest to hear anyway. So you will have two plots here. One that gives the time domain response of the filter. So it'll look something like this. And one that gives you the frequency domain response of the filter. So it'll look something like this. So those of you who have thought that you had finally gotten past the reign of terror of the C sharp FTW and lip sound and all that kind of stuff, no, we've got one more assignment with it. And you'll have a slider down here that allows you to set the frequency of the low pass corner frequency, like that. So as you slide that around, it will adjust the filter. And this graph and this graph will update. Then on the last one, we have the live filtering <coughs> view, where you will again have two line graphs. If you want to overlay them or make one pink and the other one purple, I don't care. But you'll have two of them. One which shows the filter input from the microphone. One which shows the frequency domain of the microphone. And I guess you can have like a start button or something if you want. And when you press it, it will start to filter the audio coming through the input, going passing out to the output, and it will use the filter that you designed in this one. So you said yeah. So this one's where you design the filter. Yeah. This one you use the filter, and when you press the start button or the stop or however you want to do it, it's just showing the time and frequency of the input and output, just like you did in the last uh, homework, where you have you know you're looking at the time and frequency of audio as it's passing through your phone. Only this time we're going to be filtering it as it passes through. Wait, so I thought I was done by the second page. Yeah, what's the difference between second and third? This one, you're not doing any audio input and output. This one is all just fiddling around bytes and buffers. You have a, you're building a frequency, you're building a filter. And you're displaying the properties of that filter, like the impulse response and the frequency response. It's pass bands that are LPF. This is LPF. Okay, so it's increasing. Yeah, so this, okay. this guy just changes the cutoff frequency of the filter. So you can design whatever filter you want. Cool. But what frequency do we pass in on a second page? Can you get the one just have to show something? What do you mean by frequency? Like, for a second page. Signal you show something? You're showing the signal that's passing through your phone, just like in... You're showing the, the filtered output that you're outputting to the speaker. So you have your Wasapi-like event, and you get it above the microphone, you filter it, then you display the time and frequency of that buffer and output it to the speaker. That's page three. Yeah, it's page three. Yeah, but page two, I'm talking about page two, is that, as I guess it's still going to say, so how, to display a graph, you need some data. Yep. What's that data? The data is the impulse response of your filter. Okay. So you've got the time domain and the frequency domain. So the impulse response, frequency response. And so as you adjust the slider, you change those things. And you have an able, and you have the time and frequency responses of your filter. Yes. So, so the methods to create the filter is just in the library filter. Yep. And since 
I got a lot of questions about how to use things like libsound and such. We're going to take a little bit of a tour through the code that's given you. First off, we have libsound, which is exactly how you last saw it, probably yesterday. So we've still got all of our events and all that kind of stuff. We now have, we also have the C-sharp FFTW, which hopefully is a little better understood by everybody now. And we also have this thing called libfilter. So libfilter has two classes. The first one is called filter design. Filter design is all the math that you guys are not going to have to worry about. So we have, a cons we have this thing called FIR design windowed. We give it a center frequency. Oh, I guess it's even easier to do uh, band pass and low pass and all that kind of stuff. That's fun. We've got bandwidth and we've got a window type. Now this thing is of type window type. So some of you may think, well, that's not a type I've ever heard of. And that's because it's defined right here. So in order to pass things to this FIR design windowed, you would say things like FIR design windowed 0, 0.0, .0 um, 0.25, and then window type dot rect, or window type dot han, or window type dot hamming. And these are all different kinds of window functions that you can use when doing FIR window design. Yes? Frequencies and gradient, like 0 to pi, so, this is another thing I wanted to say. There is a good fraction of, you, of the questions that I get about these, um, about these classes that I give out to you guys that are very easily solved by reading this green text right here. Now, I know that reading the green text is hard because your brain wants to skip right over it, but this green text will tell you a lot, and the reason it's there is actually to be read by humans, not by computers. So... <laughs> Right here, it says that our parameters are within 0 to 1, which means that our, um, our frequency is in what's called normalized frequency. So 0 corresponds to DC, 1 corresponds to the Nyquist rate, meaning the highest frequency that we can represent with this sampling rate. So if we passed in uh, 0.5 to center frequency, then that means that our filter would have its center at the midpoint between you know, 0 to FS over 2. If we pass in 0 to center frequency and 0.5 to bandwidth, that means we're going to keep the lower half of our spectrum and give away the higher half of our spectrum. We've also got a um, FIR design windowed where you can pass in the bandwidth and force it to be a certain length. And if you don't know why you'd want to do that, then you haven't done FIR window design before and you don't need to. We have a thing called get window length, get window bandwidth, create window, all these kinds of things that, uh, or I'm sorry, these things that have to do with, um, that have to do with figuring out kind of the length versus bandwidth um, uh, trade-off for FIR windows. For people who don't care about that kind of stuff, you don't need to worry about it because all this stuff is just used internally, but it's given out to you guys in case you want to get more exotic with your filters. Finally, this thing called create window, which you pass it an n, which is the number of samples you want the window to be, and the window type. So windows are these kind of gently sloping functions that go like this, and they're really, really useful for when you're doing audio processing that are doing kind of overlap and add style processing. Overlap and add style meaning you take your input, you chop it up into buffers, you modify one buffer, then modify another buffer, then modify another buffer, and your buffers are overlapping. And when you add them together, you use these window functions to make it so that they uh, fade into one another nicely. That's the kind of thing that you would do with your final project. If you were doing live audio processing and you weren't just doing a simple filter, but you were doing something a little more complex, like maybe making auto-tune or something like that, or like a, a Darth Vader effect or something like that, you would do that with overlap and add processing, where you take a chunk of data, do your, over, do your processing, and then instead of having to worry about taking your buffers and matching up the endpoints properly, you just fade one out and fade the other in 100 times a second. And finally, we've got some internal functions. So some of you may have noticed that we have this public thing in C++, and we have this internal thing. Internal is a C++ CX majigger, and what it does is it makes these functions not visible to C Sharp, 
but they are visible to C++. So if you were to write a C++ uh, processing function and you wanted to use these methods, you could use them. And the reason you might want to do that is because these guys take in floating point arrays rather than platform array floats. And if you really, really, really need speed and you're doing everything in C++ and you're not hooking stuff together in C Sharp, you can use these functions directly and you don't have to create platform arrays that then, you know, cause extra copies of your data and stuff like that. Once again, we haven't dealt with data where that will really matter. Even with audio, you can copy it a couple dozen times and it won't affect you too much. But with video, you're not going to be able to do that. Copying a frame every, fr every 30th of a second is going to take way too long. Yes? Um, so why would we bother creating a window if it creates a window and filters them? Because we, if, if, why go through the trouble of making the filter windowing it as opposed to a, as an FIR design window seems? The reason is because you might want to use the window for something else, not just an FIR filter. If you were, if you were to use the window to do, like I said, overlap and add processing, if you're not just doing a basic FIR filter, like Auto-Tune is not a basic FIR filter. It's much more complicated than that. But you still use these windows. And calculating these windows isn't, I mean, it's, it's not really difficult, but it's not trivial either. So to calculate the window, you, this is the create window function. So it's just a bunch of cosines and magic floating point numbers and stuff, and it's just not any fun to write, you know? You have these like weird, constants here and you pass them into cosine and add them together and subtract them and stuff and it's not anything you want to have to remember. So this function is just here so that when you want to make a 512 point Blackman window you just call it and it gives you the window. It's used internally by the rest of the filter design stuff but if you want to use it in another place you can. Yes? Uh, not really related but what's the difference between internal and the difference between internal and private is that internal hides it from C Sharp, private hides it from everyone. So other C++ things won't be able to use a private function. And the reason we do that is because if we're passing around floating point arrays, that doesn't work in C Sharp. It doesn't like to see float star, that pointer type. All right. Let's talk about the other class in this libfilter thing. It's called, surprise, surprise, filter. Filter has a little bit of a design. We say, all right, we create you by passing in an impulse response. We have a destructor to clean everything up. We have a function called filter that takes in a single float and passes out a single float. So that's used for, say, feeding one new sample into the filter and then returning one new sample of output. So that's like when we had the the x coming around like this, and then the h, which was, a, uh, which was the impulse response, and we were shifting and doing the dot product, shifting and doing the dot product. This is the math for doing one shift. Whereas this filter takes in an array, passes out an array, and so if you give it 10 numbers, then it does the shift and dot product for 10 times and gives you 10 numbers back. You guys are thinking, wow, this is really useful. It's going to be so nice to use this in the in the uh, homework. That's because there's nothing written yet. <laughs> this is the part that you guys fill in. So this filter class is not set in stone. You guys can architect it however you want. But this is an example way to architect it, where you have a filter function here that does a single sample, and then a filter function here that does multiple samples. The reason we might want to separate out these two is, first off, this guy can be written in terms of this guy and make this guy a lot simpler. And secondly, there are some data sources where instead of getting a buffer every time we want to do an operation, we get a single sample every time we want to do an operation. Things like accelerometers, compasses, GPSs, that kind of thing. We get a single sample every time new data comes in, whereas with audio we get a full buffer every time. So what this gives us the freedom to do is have a single filter object that can filter all the different kinds of data types that we're going to deal with, except for the camera, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> so are there any questions about kind of how all the different pieces of this homework fit together?
So far, we've talked about the camera page. We literally walked through like all the code you need to do. So um, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, concerned that I now have a video recording of like all the code that you guys need to do for this that I'm going to post later. But we'll see how it goes. We've talked about filter design, how to use the, um, how to use the filtering to, the filter class to generate a impulse response. Uh, we've talked about the difference between the time and frequency domain. We haven't talked about the slider, but I assume you guys can Google MSDN and figure out how to use sliders on your projects, because some of you have already. And we have pretty much done exactly this live filtering thing before, except for the filtering part. We've done the audio input and output, displaying it to the user and all that kind of stuff. And now all you just need to do is add in a call to filter on the data and output that instead of the original data. So, any questions about how this homework fits together? So we have to write, or we have to fill in these <coughs> uh, filter classes in the C++ so that it, it helps. Uh, is, that, is this for the header file function or is this for the C sharp function? Whatever. So what this we, header file shows us that we have four functions. Right. This C++ file shows us that those four functions have nothing in them except comments. Okay. And so you guys should replace the green text with non-green text. <laughs> All right. So some MISIC info for homework four is first off, don't forget to look up all the, all the permissions needed, which is something you're going to be doing for every homework, of course. And if you want to use a stream more than once, you need to rewind it. So this is one of those lines in the example that I removed because I said we don't need to worry about it right now. This is because when you have a stream object, like that stream that we get when the camera has data for us to read in, we're going to want to do two things with it. The first thing we want to do is we want to save it to the media library. The second thing we want to do is we want to output it to the user. When we save it to the media library, the media library will mark all the bytes that it just saved as having been consumed. It will say, all right, I dealt with all this data, and then give us back the stream. So we want to output those exact same bytes again to the screen. And so to do that, we have to use this seek function. And finally, the camera can take time to initialize, so you need to communicate to your user somehow that the camera is ready. Because you can't just boot up and start immediately hitting the shutter button. All right, any questions? How does the, the, the function that you're talking about for the filtering, mm -hmm. I mean, how would you be able to filter a single number without any context with the rest of the stream of data? That is a really good point. That's why we have an array called impulse response and an array called previous data. <coughs> You have to keep, when you're doing filtering, you do have to keep track of the previous data that's been sent into you. So for instance, inside this filter function, you'll store this float in your previous data buffer, and then you can do your dot product. Good question. All right. If there are no further questions, the homework for template should be up on GitHub. The homework three solution should be posted. Um, for those of you who, haven't been, who have no idea where the solutions are, they are actually on GitHub. You go to the GitHub page. You go to homework, let's say homework three. Actually, I think I still have to do one thing. Let's go to homework two. You click down here on master and it has solution right there. So if you click on this, you can see I have a commit here that is the example solution for homework two. If you really just love Git and you want to see the difference between the two, you can click that little green button and you can see, aha, in mainpage.xaml, he deleted all this. He added in these things in mainpage.xaml.cs. He adds in all this code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you really don't care about that, you can just download the solution 
straight from here by cloning it or by downloading the zip file, whatever. It should be noted, I tried to use a fancy git feature for homework three called submodules that ended up not working out too well because when you click download zip, it doesn't download the contents of these three folders. The reason for that is because these folders are actually not contained within this repository. There are actually separate repositories called C Sharp FFTW, Line Graph, and LibSound that have those contents within them. And the reason I did it that way is because when most people work on these kinds of projects, these, um, these repositories are somewhat separated from the homework three repository. We're using C Sharp FTW, we're using LibSound, all that kind of stuff in multiple projects. And so having them separated out into their own repositories allows me to make a bug fix in one of them and have it apply to all of them. Unfortunately, this download zip button does not work with these. So for the future, we won't be using, um, we won't be using these submodules. Instead, if we look at the homework four, we see that C Sharp FTW, LibFilter, and LibSound are just normal folders within this Homework 4 repository. Um, other than that, let's see if I've added you guys to the Homework 4. I have. Looks like someone's already cloned Homework 4. Good for you. Or forked Homework 4. And that's it for today. So I have a question, actually. Yes. So you know how for previous homework, you always put up in the material, like, what, like an application yes. for how the homework solution should look like? Yes. How do you actually run that? Nobody can figure it out. So, in Windows, those .zap files are basically .exes for the Windows phone. Oh. So if we go into, if we, if we go into <laughs> repositories, materials, week four, uh, let's not go to week four because I haven't posted that one yet. Let's go to week three, homework. We've got this homework three emulator and homework three phone thing. Now, in the email I sent out, I said, you use this thing called Windows Phone Application Deployment thing. It's, there's an application deployment app that gets installed by the Windows Phone 8 SDK thing. When you run this, it comes up with this, and it says, do you want to load it onto a device or an emulator? I'm going to say load it onto this emulator. I find the .zap, and I say deploy. And it does this, and now that was terrible. Now there's a homework three. Wait, you actually say all this in your emails? Yep. <laughs> Man, I hope I sent out an email. I send some long emails sometimes, so you know what? I'll just check later. Would you guys rather have short emails that don't tell you how to do it? No, 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 no. We want the long ones. We want the All right. Maybe I'll have a comprehension test on the emails I send out at the beginning of every video. All right. I'll see you guys upstairs. And if you need a phone, come see me upstairs. I'll have an Excel spreadsheet where you can fill out all the information about which phone it is, and you can check it out for the rest of the quarter.